Video 17 of Artificial Intelligence. I'm going to talk now about machine learning with a specific emphasis on neural networks. Although the initial introduction that I'm going to give um, is much more widely applicable and in fact it would be a big mistake to think that neural networks are the only approach to doing this. Right back at the beginning of the course I gave a dire warning um, that you were going to need to be able to do some essentially straightforward things involving multivariate calculus of the kind that I'm very much hoping will be familiar from the um, Natural Sciences uh, Mathematics course. I'm hoping that you went and reviewed that. If you didn't and you've forgotten about that stuff then you really should because otherwise this is going to be a bit hard to follow. If you do feel confident with that material in particular, partial differentiation and the use of the chain rule for partial differentiation, then what follows is basically straightforward. Um, there's a lot of it, and it is reasonably complicated the first time that you see it, but it really is just the application of a couple of fairly basic techniques um, over and over again. And if you follow it through a couple of times and just keep track of what refers to what, and remember that all we're actually doing is differentiating a function, um, you should be fine. In any case, these were the two questions I asked and that I suggested you should uh, think about to make sure that you're up to speed on this stuff. The first one just gives you a function of n variables, uh, namely a weighted sum of their squares, and asks you to compute a partial derivative. Well, I'm hoping that this is straightforward for you, because if I write this summation out in full, then I've got a1 x1 squared plus dot 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 plus. Okay, we're differentiating with respect to xj, which will appear as aj xj squared plus dot 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 all the way to the end of this thing, which is going to be a n x n squared. And hopefully you will have noticed that the only term in that sum that depends on j is this one. So all the others differentiate to naught, and this guy differentiates to 2 a j x j. And we're done. The second question just asks you to take a function of some functions. I'm dropping a big hint there. Um, and in fact, it is just the standard statement of the chain rule for partial differentiation. Now, we're going to use uh, that an awful lot later on. So, in single variable calculus, if you have a function that is just f of g of x and you want df by dx, you would compute df by dg, dg by x. Okay, that's do this by dx. So, having got that out of the way, I'm only going to talk in this course about supervised learning. There are other kinds which I will mention, just for completeness, but I'm only going to look in any detail at all about supervised learning. Um, and there are various things that any good computer scientist should know about machine learning. Uh, and one of those is that they should know about the perceptron, and the other is that they should know about multilayer perceptrons, and the backpropagation algorithm for training them. So these are the things that I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to start by just setting up the kinds of problem that we're interested in, and I'm going to use medical diagnosis because it's a common source of problems in AI, and it's one where neural networks have had quite a lot of success. So imagine we want to automate the diagnosis of an embarrassing disease, which I shall call D. And I want to do that by designing a machine that takes some measurements that you get from the patient, and outputs a 1 if the patient suffers from D and naught otherwise. Now this can be measurements like heart rate, blood pressure and so on, 
Or you can take the idea of a measurement to the extreme and just give the machine um, the pixel values for an x-ray. But the first point here is that clearly actually making this machine a computer and just writing a program to do this um, is not something that experience suggests is going to be a successful approach. Now in fact while things like rule-based systems have been used successfully to do medical diagnosis, it turns out to be really quite difficult and one reason for that is that you have to do it by bringing in experts on the condition that you're trying to diagnose and getting them to explain how they do the diagnosis. And experts can't necessarily give you a sufficiently complete explanation of how they're working for you to then encode it as a bunch of rules that you can use in a rule-based system. This is historically called the Fiegenbaum bottleneck. Um, and this doesn't necessarily only have to apply to trying to use rule-based systems. In general, if you want to write a program to do something like this, you have to have some idea of how a person does it. And that can be something that's very difficult to extract from a person. So the alternative approach is to still rely on a collection of measurements taken from your patient. Um, and we can form those into a vector. Now I've written this uh, with a transpose on it. And the reason for that is that it is now essentially a, a universally applied convention in machine learning research that vectors are column vectors. So if you look in textbooks for this kind of material or you look in the research literature for this kind of material, you will find them written as column vectors, which means that if I want to write something here on a single line, I have to transpose it, hence the transpose sign. So please do not get thrown by that. The key thing here is that if I have a patient and I take measurements from them, then I can form those measurements into a vector. And if a measurement isn't naturally one that you can assign a number to, like does the patient have green spots, then you can encode it um, in some suitable way. For example, you can encode it as one if the patient has green spots and not otherwise. And you can take all the measurements that you have for your patient and form them into a vector in this way. Now this is called a feature vector or an instance. And the measurements are generally either referred to as attributes or features. Now something I'm not going to have time to talk about much in this course is the importance of designing those attributes or features. If you have extremely large quantities of data you may be able to get your learner to infer good features for you, uh, but that depends very much on having an extremely large amount of data. Um, often, for problems where you have less data, or the data is expensive to get hold of, or where automated feature inference just isn't a feasible thing, actually designing good features becomes a key part of the design process for a supervised learner. So be aware of that, but I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Your features will generally be either continuous binary or discrete. Pretty much always you can get them into this format. So they'll either be, uh, well, not, not necessarily real valued, but floating point valued, um, constrained within some range, or binary, or they'll take one of a finite number of values. Now the next step looks like this. Imagine you have a large collection of patient histories. So we usually denote the number of these by M. And that for each patient history, you know whether or not the patient suffered from D. So the ith patient history gives you an instance vector, a feature vector, X sub I. And that can then be paired with a single bit, 0 or 1 which denotes whether or not the ith patient suffered from the disease. That pair is called an example, or in this case to be specific, a labelled example. And if we collect them together, for all the patient histories we have, then we have a training sequence. 
So training sequence S is just a collection of labeled examples, and a labeled example contains a vector of features and a label. Now the key underlying idea with supervised learning is that you want a learning algorithm which takes some training examples and produces a hypothesis, which begs the question, what is a hypothesis? Well, intuitively speaking, in this example, it's something that lets us diagnose new patients. And this is a, a real key aspect of supervised learning. You want the hypothesis that comes out of your learning algorithm to be capable of diagnosing patients or, in general, classifying instances that the system has never seen before. And if it can do that, we say that it generalizes. It generalizes from the specific examples that you have that were used by the learning algorithm to turn training examples into hypothesis. And it generalizes the knowledge in such a way that H can classify previously unseen things. And aim of the game is to get generalization. Now that means that we can actually model a hypothesis as just being a function. It's a function that will take any attribute vector, even one that we haven't seen before, and turn it into a label. Or in the case of the running medical diagnosis example, it will take uh, a feature vector from any patient at all, whether they've been seen before or not, that attribute vector can be plugged into the, the hypothesis, and the hypothesis is just a function, so it outputs a label, and we hope that the label is the correct one. Now, the label doesn't have to be just a one or a zero. Uh, it can be typically one of a finite number of classes if we are doing classification, and in this case, up until now, I've talked about binary classification, where there are only two classes. Patient has disease, patient doesn't have disease. But we could equally well try and train a classifier that classifies into three classes, with a third that means, don't ask me, buddy, I'm just a computer. And that third option can, in fact, be a very important one. And some more advanced supervised learning methods don't just output a class that they think is the correct one to place the feature vector into, they also output a measure of their certainty. It may, for example, be in something like medical diagnosis. That if the classification is very uncertain, that we would want the computer to pass the problem over to a human um, in order to obtain a better judgment. The other typical kind of um, supervised learning we have is regression where instead of assigning a class to a feature vector, we assign a real number. This would be appropriate if, for example, we we're trying to learn to predict how much rainfall they would be tomorrow. There's a third possibility, which is somewhat between the first two. In some cases, we want a real valued output from our hypothesis that denotes the probability of being in one class or another. And in that case, we might, for example, assign a feature vector to one class if the hypothesis gives us a value of greater than a half. But in this case, the hypothesis output would be constrained to be a number between zero and one. And we then, for example, might think about looking at how close to a half it is in order to decide whether or not we're sufficiently confident in the prediction that we're going to make. Now, the whole point here is that we don't want to design a hypothesis explicitly. The starting point was essentially that we don't know how to do that. So for supervised learning, the overall process looks like this. We have a training sequence of labeled feature vectors. That goes to a learning algorithm. The learning algorithm gives us a hypothesis, which is just a function, and that function can then be used to take any feature vector x and turn it into a label. Now, something that may seem a little odd at the moment, but which will uh, 
seem a lot clearer fairly soon, I hope, is that we would generally constrain the kinds of hypothesis that our learning algorithm is allowed to produce. So that hypothesis will come from some collection of possibilities called the hypothesis space. Again, that may not seem sensible right now, but I'll be demonstrating in a moment that it is actually critical. Another subtlety here is that the learner can output a hypothesis explicitly by outputting some actual description of a function. Alternatively, and this is the case for neural networks, which is what I'll mostly be talking about, it can output a vector of what are generally referred to as weights, and those in turn specify what the function is, what the hypothesis is. And that means that we're then writing the hypothesis h of x in terms of both the weights and the x value. Okay, so now the hypothesis is actually a function f. What it does specifically is defined by selecting these weights w and having plugged in a particular bunch of weights w that come out of the learning algorithm, we then get something that we can treat as a function of x, which we use for the hypothesis. Now, you've probably inferred from all the uh, extraordinary hype around machine learning that we've had for the last couple of years, that this kind of idea can be applied in practice with great success in a very large number of areas. And that is true. But I want to point out two things here. The first is that it's not the only kind of learning. There's also unsupervised learning, semi-supervised learning, learning using membership or equivalence queries, and reinforcement learning. Now, the latter has also had a lot of uh, press lately, for very good reasons. Um, but some of the other learning methods here are, I suspect, less well known to you. And again, um, I don't have time within this course to talk about them, uh, but certainly in my course next year, I talk at great length about unsupervised learning and a little bit about semi-supervised learning. Um, and these are, for now, just other things to be aware of. But what I really want to point out in this slide is that the application of supervised learning methods in practice, in ways that you have all been using, probably without realizing it, is not a new thing. And I have a few examples here, namely that supervised learning has been used for decades in speech recognition, in applications in banking, such as whether or not to give credit, in the detection of credit card fraud, and so on. Back as far as the 80s and perhaps even earlier than that, there was considerable interest in using supervised learning in applications such as diagnosis of various varieties of cancer. And I don't need to read these examples out in detail, but I will simply direct your attention to the last one here, because if you think that automatic driving is a new thing, I suggest you look up the work by Pomelo's group from 1989, and yes, that is the correct date, I haven't made an error, um, in which they were driving a car for 90 miles at 70 miles an hour on a public road with other cars present and with no assistance from humans. This was a, an application of a multi-layer perceptron of the kind that I'm about to introduce to you.